This year we have been studying under the theme of faith at ground level, narratives of life. Each week we're looking at a different story of a different biblical character. And today we're going to continue along those lines. In just a moment I want to read two passages from the Old Testament book of First. Samuel. You'll find it right before 2 Samuel. That'll help you to locate it. I want to read from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, and then from 1 Samuel 21, verse 13, because those two passages, just five chapters apart, portray a high point and a low point in the life of one of God's people. The first passage tells us, Then Samuel, who was a prophet of God, took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Now listen to the contrast. Five chapters later, So David disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. I've entitled today's study, From Goliath to Gath, The Struggles of a Devout Heart. Let's look to the Lord together in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to engage you through your living, eternal word. You've told us it never returns to you void. Every time we encounter the word, we're encountering you. And every time we encounter you, there is the potential for us to be renewed in our thinking and transformed in our living, to move one step closer to full maturity in Christ. Let that be our goal today. Let that be the result of our time in the word. By your Spirit, empower me to do what I could never, never do on my own. And by your Spirit, empower us to apply your truth, because we can't do that on our own. Let the church mature, that it might honor you and fulfill its mandate in the world. And we pray these things with full confidence in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And as we study God's Word on this snowy March day in Pittsburgh, may the Lord be with you. In his classic book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis made an observation that is very relevant for our study today. He said, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that's left in him. But when a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. Now today, we're going to launch a five-week study of a man whose life story can help each one of us better understand the evil that is still left in us. Though he is hailed in Scripture as a man after God's own heart, he was often a study in contrast. One moment, triumphant faith. The next moment, tragic fear. One moment, devotion to God. The next moment, deception of friends. During his lifetime, he would kill a giant. He would model humility and faith. He would conquer armies. He would skillfully govern a nation. He would draw close to God. He would pen sacred music that is still sung in our day. And he would write a significant portion of Scripture. But this same man would also fake insanity and embrace adultery and betray loyalty and concoct a cover-up worthy of a philandering dictator. It's no wonder that David's musical portfolio includes majestic anthems of praise and also very raw, gritty blues filled with complaints and grievances and haunting questions. The story of David as given to us in Scripture reminds me of something a pastor named Alan Redpath said a number of decades ago. He said, the Bible never flatters its heroes. It tells us the truth about each one of them in order that against the background of human breakdown and failure, we may magnify the grace of God. 
and recognize that it is the delight of the Spirit of God to work upon the platform of human impossibilities. The things that would be impossible for us left to ourselves, those are the things the Holy Spirit of God wants to perform in your life and in mine. Our study of David will remind us of several things. It will remind us that the conversion of our soul is a miracle that unfolds in just a moment. But the transformation of our soul is a miracle that requires a lifetime. A lifetime of attention, a lifetime of intention, a lifetime of devotion. And along the way, we're going to experience both successes and setbacks. Both are inevitable. That's why David on more than one occasion had to pray things like, Lord, renew a right spirit within me. I've gotten off onto a detour. I've lost something. I need a right spirit renewed within me. And another thing that David's dramatic story affirms to us is that we will never offer God a unique challenge or problem. Never. Something you will never hear in heaven is God looking at you in your problem and going, Wow, who saw that coming? I've never seen anything like that. Angels, come over here. Have you ever seen anything like this? This isn't anywhere in our policy manual. I've never had to deal with this before. Quite frankly, I don't know what I'm going to do here. No, every temptation you face every spiritual battle you're engaged in, every failure and setback you endure, it's common. God has seen it all again and again and again. And he wants you to see yourself in the struggles and the successes of David so that he might use David in an instructive way in your life to help you grow in grace and in your knowledge of God. We're going to begin our study of David's life today by looking at three events in the earliest chapters of his life. We first encounter David in Scripture as a teenager, probably somewhere between 13 to 15 years of age. We first encounter him as he is summoned by the prophet Samuel so that he might be anointed, so that he might be the next king of Israel after the reign of King Saul. Now, I want to remind you that all throughout Scripture, anointing symbolizes something. It symbolizes God's empowerment given through the Holy Spirit, an empowerment that enables us to discern and accomplish God's purposes, to know what God is up to, to know our part in it, and to carry out our part effectively. That empowerment is anointing. Now, Saul had been anointed with the Holy Spirit as the first king of Israel. And he had genuinely prophesied and spoken from God. But thereafter, Saul engaged in one compromise after another, one act of rebellion and presumption and disobedience after another. And by the time we read about David's anointing, Saul still had the crown, but he had lost his anointing. He had the office, but he didn't have the power. He was going to need to be replaced, and when that day came, David would be his replacement. Now, to set the stage, the prophet Samuel was instructed to go to the house of a man named Jesse and look over Jesse's sons. One of them was going to be the next king. And so Jesse assembles his sons, and as Samuel looks them over, he looked at one who was head and shoulders above the rest, who stood out from the crowd, David's oldest brother named Eliab. And Samuel immediately assumed he's got to be the one. He's the most impressive man in the bunch. But it was at that point that God said, wrong, he's not the one. And God explained that by saying something that has since become very famous, God said, Samuel, you need to remember, man looks on the outward appearance, I look at the heart. Eliab, outwardly, is an impressive fellow. I'll grant you that. But his heart is not good. And he's not worthy of being king. Don't select him. 
Well, Samuel looked at the other six brothers, and God said, no, 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 and no. Leading Samuel to ask Jesse, well, do you have any other sons? Jesse said, well, yes, there's one more, the youngest, David. He's out tending the sheep. Now, the language that Jesse used indicated not only that David was the youngest in terms of age, but that he didn't see a lot of potential in David. After all, when asked to gather all of his sons, he didn't invite David. He figured, well, he can't possibly be the one. So he left David out with the sheep. He didn't see any potential, but God did, because God sees the heart. And God knew that in the heart of that teenage boy, David, there was a deep devotion that had all been, already been expressed in some of the Psalms that he wrote while he was a teenager before he was anointed. And the anointing of David reminds us that God's anointing, God's empowering is given to submissive hearts, not impressive resumes. People sometimes assume, boy, if a famous athlete or a famous businessman or somebody in Hollywood who's famous would become a follower of Jesus, think of the impact they could have. And you see, that kind of thinking isn't really biblical thinking because the assumption there is because somebody has an impressive human resume, they'd be a great servant of God. But it's not your natural gifting that makes you a great servant of God. It's your submissive heart. See, and that's good news, because we aren't all going to be exceptionally gifted, but we can all be submissive and obedient unto God. And so every child of God can know God's anointing. See, God doesn't want you relying upon your natural abilities. He doesn't even want you relying upon your spiritual gifts. He wants you relying upon Him. He wants you living with the knowledge that apart from Him, you can do nothing. Because when you rely on something other than God, that's just another form of what? Idolatry, self-worship. So David, who was submissive, was selected and anointed. Now, soon after David was elected by God, he would be summoned by Saul, who was already starting to break down. I hope you know that when you engage in spiritual sin and compromise, it affects every aspect of your being. It affects your health. It affects your emotions. It affects your relationships. And Saul was a certified mess. All of his disobedience, all of his compromise had made him a paranoid, anxious, depressed man who could not sleep. Somebody told him about this skilled teenage musician. And so David was summoned to play for Saul to help him find peace of heart and momentary peace of mind and to find a little bit of rest and refreshment. And he would play for Saul whenever Saul summoned him. But the day would come, and it would not take long, till Saul would turn against David and would seek to take his life and would set up a manhunt to find him and execute him that would unfold over a long period of time. And the fact that Saul's attitude towards David changed so dramatically should not catch us by surprise. Because those who come into alignment with God inevitably come into collision with Satan. When you align your life with God's kingdom and God's purposes, that will bring you into a head-on collision with Satan's principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness. You will encounter opposition. As I've shared with you many times before, my dad used to always say to his children, if the devil isn't bothering you, it's because you aren't bothering him. But if you're bothering him, he will be bothering you. David's devotion was a bother to the enemy, so he moved into territory that he occupied, the heart of Saul, and put it into the heart of Saul to execute David. But more of that later. For the time being, David was going to have to face a literally much larger opponent than Saul. Because the next episode in his youth was the day that he faced the giant Philistine known to us as Goliath. A warrior over eight foot tall, decked out in armaments. He appeared one day as the armies of Israel were arrayed against the armies of the Philistines. 
And he came out of the ranks of the Philistines, and he walked down into the valley between the two armies. Both of them were occupying high ground. He came down into the valley, and he said, rather than all of us fighting one another, I'm going to suggest a contest. You pick your best man and send him down to fight me. If I win, you Israelis will be our slaves. If your guy wins, we Philistines will be your slaves. Pick out a man. Let's do battle. And an interesting thing when you read the story of David and Goliath, you know, there's so much in the details of Scripture. The story begins by saying, Goliath came down into the valley to make his boast. But by the time David came into the encampment, we read that he saw the giant coming up towards the armies of Israel. You say, well, what's the big deal there? It's a reminder that if you don't face a giant, when it first challenges you, that giant will start to take more and more ground until it's literally in your face. You can't maintain status quo with the giant. You either got to kill it or it's got to keep moving in and taking more and more from you. And that's what was happening. Now, the story of David and Goliath is one that resonates with every one of our hearts because we all face giants in life. Situations, problems, obstacles, people, political situations, economic situations that seem to defy our faith and mock our trust in God. But David's response to this giant reminds us of a very important truth. You need to know that giants don't create your spiritual realities. They only reveal them and they invite you to growth. Giants don't create your spiritual realities, yet we often assume they do when we say things like this. I never had a problem with bitterness until that happened. I never had a problem with anger until he did that. I never had a problem with fear until I became aware of my disease. And when we say things like that, the implication is that the event, the person, the setback, whatever, somehow could forcibly put fear or bitterness or anger or unbelief in our soul. Giants can't put anything in your soul. All they do is reveal what was already there. Maybe you never knew it was there because it lacked opportunity. The giant just brings opportunity. Far better to say, I didn't realize how much anger was in me until that giant appeared. I didn't realize how prone I am to bitterness until that giant appeared. I didn't realize how much fear is in me. I didn't realize how much evil is still in me until that giant appeared. All giants do is reveal who you already are. They don't change you, but they do give you an opportunity to change if you'll trust God as you face them. Now, what did Goliath reveal? Goliath revealed that there were three kinds of warriors in the encampment of Israel. I like to call them the unanointed, the once anointed, and the anointed. The unanointed were the soldiers of Israel. Now, these men were experienced in battle. They were adequately equipped and they were highly motivated. They were fighting for their families and for their freedom and for their future. They did not want to be slaughtered by the Philistines. But even though they were equipped, even though they were experienced, even though they were motivated, when Goliath appeared, they were frozen in panic and fear because they had not known the empowerment of God's spirit. Now, they attempted to mask their fear in a tragic comic event that went on every day because we read every day they would put on all their battle garb and they would line up in their ranks as if they were ready for battle and they would shout war cries and then Goliath would appear and they'd all back up. This went on day after day. Get all your armor ready. Get ready. Get in file with one another. Shout the war cry for the glory of our God, for the nation of Israel. And then Goliath appears and everybody says, I'm out of here. Now, don't be too hard on them because Christians do the same thing many times in places of worship like this. 
Christians come into a place like this and line up shoulder to shoulder with other believers and sing, what a mighty God we serve. And then the next morning at work, when somebody asks them about their faith, I'm out of here. Afraid. Intimidated. That's why A.W. Tozer once said, Christians don't tell lies, but they certainly sing them. So I say we can see ourselves all through these stories. Something else, the unanointed warriors resented David's faith. This teenager comes in, he's been watching sheep, and he basically said, loose translation, why are you letting this fool continue to do this? This is an embarrassment for the people of God. Why hasn't somebody taken that fool out? And when David suggested that, they hated him. And Eliab, remember him? The oldest brother, he took David to task and basically said, you punk kid, what do you know about war? Go back and take care of your sheep and let the men do the men's work. Problem is, none of the men were manning up. Those were the unanointed warriors. Then there was the tragic once anointed. That was Saul. He was the king. He was the commander in chief. But he had lost his anointing and he had lost his boldness. So now he was reduced to pathetic attempts at bribery. He said, if somebody else will go out and in essence do my job for me, I will give him great wealth and I'll give him my daughter's hand in marriage and make him a part of the royal family. And nobody took him up on his offer. Wonder why. Then David comes along and says, I'll do it. An unarmed teenager, I'll do it. And quickly, he attempted to discourage him. You can't do it, you're not able. Because the once anointed and the unanointed always seek to discourage faith. You can't do it. It's impossible. Can't possibly be. I remember when God called me here 30 years ago. There were pastors who said, that church has no future in that location. It should have moved years ago. You're going to waste your life. Can't happen. God had a different idea. Then when he couldn't dissuade David, he did something else equally foolish. He said, well, if you're going to go out, take my armor. Now, David was going to use a slingshot. He needed to be nimble. Why would he want Saul's heavy armor hanging on him when he's trying to use his sling? So he said, no thanks. But there's a lesson in there as well. It reminds us of something David knew. You don't defeat the world by adopting its methods. Saul thought, if you've got an armored giant, how do you defeat it? By putting on your own armor. By meeting armor with armor. But that's the way the world thinks. And this is an important lesson that a lot of churches forget because a lot of congregations who are afraid of becoming irrelevant in a failed attempt to be relevant are starting to adopt the world's methods so that people think they're up to date and hip. And what we're supposed to offer the world is not a pale reflection of its methods, but we're supposed to offer the world a clear-cut alternative to their spiritual insanity. You don't change the world by looking like the world. You change the world by looking very different from the world. David understood that. Well, David was the anointed warrior. So where others saw adversity, he saw opportunity. When everybody else was saying, Goliath is so big we can't defeat him, David said, that fool is so big I can't miss him. I mean, I've killed the bear and the lion and they're quick and nimble. This dude's eight foot plus tall and he just stands there. I can't miss him. So he takes five stones. People always speculate, why five? Ask him when you get to heaven. But I don't think he thought he was going to get five shots. He would launch the stone and then there would be the countermeasure. Goliath would be launching his massive spear. No, we learn from other scriptures that the Goliath giant had four giant brothers. And revenge in family matters was big in that day. And I think David was ready for family feud in his day. 
But whatever the reason, he only needed one because his first stone found the one spot on that heavily armored giant where he was vulnerable. And again, there's a lesson for us. Every giant has a place of vulnerability. God knows where it is. And when you allow the Holy Spirit of God to direct your efforts, God will direct your little stone, your efforts, your ministry, your act of obedience towards the one place in that giant where it's vulnerable and that giant will come down. That's why the most important thing in ministry is not being creative. It's being able to listen for God and discern God and respond to God and do what God says when God says it in God's timing and in God's ways because then God directs your stone to the giant's vulnerable spot. <clears throat> and the result of this was an entire nation was spared because of one boy's faith. Think of that. One boy's faith spared an entire nation. But, oh, and there's that word. Things were got to change as quickly as you can say, fear. Because Satan is always ready with a new tactic, and even strong, tested faith can falter. A victory in the past doesn't make you invincible in the future. And so David soon succumbed to fear. Fear is always the enemy of faith because it sees life through the clouds of circumstances rather than the light of God's love. If you know that God loves you, why would you fear anything? See, fear just indicates that we're doubting God's love for us. In fact, fear is a mild form of atheism. If God loves you, why would you fear anything? But Saul was seeking to kill David, so he fled to a little village by the name of Nob. And the first place he stopped was the place of worship, the tabernacle. That was a good decision. When your soul is anxious, go to the place of worship. But David was quickly got to discover that the place of worship isn't always comfortable. The place of worship isn't always comfortable. The priest on duty sensed that something was amiss, and he asked David, something's not right here. What's wrong? You see, the place of worship is where God's Spirit asks, why are you like this? We come to a place of worship wanting to be affirmed and comforted, and that's good. But it's also a place where the Holy Spirit asks us tough questions. Why are you like this? You used to be joyful, now you're bitter. You used to serve me with gladness, now you don't serve anymore because somebody in the past at the church made a decision, you didn't, dis you didn't agree with it, you got your feelings hurt, and you've been pouting rather than serving ever since. Why are you in a mess like this? See, those are the kind of questions the Spirit wants to ask when you come here. Don't come to the assembly looking only for comfort. Come looking for conviction as well and welcome it because it's God's invitation to freedom. Well, when asked the question, what did David do? What did the slayer of giants do? What did the young champion of faith do? He lied. Then out of the corner of his eye, he saw the chief herdsman for Saul's herds, and he knew that that guy was going to go back and report his whereabouts. So he fled. But the herdsman reported his whereabouts. Saul assumed that the priests had sheltered David and protected him, and thus were opposed to their king. And so he sent out his troops, and all 86 priests and their wives and their innocent children were slaughtered by Saul, save for one who escaped to tell David the tragic story. And when David heard it, he was crushed. Because David learned that unbelief has dire consequences, not only for us, but for others. See, his disobedience, his fear, his lie not only touched him, but it led to the slaughter of hundreds of innocent people. One of the biggest lies Satan will ever seek to tell you is this. Your sin may hurt you, but it's not hurting anybody else. Your porn addiction, it's not hurting anybody. The things that you're allowing yourself to think about, it's not hurting anybody else. Your financial decisions, it's not hurting anybody else. The way you use your time, it's not hurting 
anybody else. The things you choose to set before your eyes, it's not hurting anybody else. That's one of the biggest lies the devil tells. Every time I let sin in my life, it not only affects me, it affects what God wants to do through me for others, to others, and other people will always experience the consequences of your and my sin. Always. Because if your sin grieves God's spirit in your life, how can you be positioned to be a bold, effective, discerning witness? You can't. And somebody may not hear the gospel because you're all wrapped up in your sin. Don't tell me there is no such thing as a private sin. Every sin you commit has public ramifications, and the enemy knows that. That's why David would learn that coming to worship for comfort while refusing the conviction of sin is not enough. You come to worship to be comforted and convicted. Well, we have to hurry to the end. David fled to the king of Gath. Gath was Goliath's old neighborhood. That's where he came from, Goliath of Gath. So now David's hanging out with pagans, the very pagans that produced Goliath. See, when you're in sin, you always seek out sinful company, don't you? The king received him. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe Goliath had been his political rival and he felt David had done him a favor. But the people of that region knew of David and they thought he's here spying for Israel. He's up to no good. So in fear for his life, he intentionally acted like he was a madman, drooling upon himself, scribbling on the walls, speaking incoherently until he appeared such a fool that the king sent him away in disgrace, thinking he was nuts. And if you had told David the day after he slayed Goliath that he would quickly be in a mess like that, he would have never believed you. But it's a reminder that the place of victory can quickly give way to the place of defeat if we aren't watching our heart every moment that we live. Let me say one other thing at this point. David feigning madness so he wouldn't be detected is something Christians can still do today because when we don't want to be detected in our workplace, when we don't want to be detected as a child of God in our neighborhood, sometimes we act like we're participating in the madness of the world, that we're just as insane as those who are living without Christ because we don't want to be discovered. So this is an ancient history. It may be your history today. What happened to David? Was that the end? You know it wasn't. Was he beyond restoration? Absolutely not. God touched him and he wrote Psalm 56 and Psalm 34 in the aftermath of that experience. And Psalm 34 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to leave you with this thought from David's early life. His early life teaches us that God can do incredible things through us if we'll take him at his word and trust him. But his early life also warns us that spiritual failure and fear can touch those who have previously been heroic. And no previous victory makes me immune to tomorrow's defeat. The distance between Goliath and Gath was very short. But thankfully... The distance from Gath to God's restoration was equally short. David moved from the mountaintop of victory to the pits of defeat in a few moments, but then God stepped in and took him back to the place of faith and victory in a few moments. You're going to fail, but don't make it your permanent address. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for David's story and all that it offers us as we seek to follow you faithfully amidst both our successes and our setbacks. Help each one of us to hear both the comfort and the conviction we need. In Jesus' name, amen.